The Allies are about to win the war in Europe. But as documents of confidential wartime meetings reveal, a new fight is just beginning. What guarantee will there be that there will be an independent Poland? A kto ugrażyt niezawisłości Polski? Sowiecki Sojusz? Behind closed doors, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill begins to lose his patience over the key question, who will control where? You are absolutely incapable of facing facts. Never in my life have I seen such people. As the Nazi Empire is attacked from east and west, this is the story of an alliance that is falling apart. So, who will take Berlin? Me? Or the Soviet Union? And as Stalin soldiers move west into the territory of their enemies, some of them seek revenge. Oh! I was 16, almost 16. And my sister was 40. We were just young, very young. And we didn't know what they were doing. In the summer of 1944, the Allies were advancing through France. The Germans were suffering heavy losses. The Supreme Allied Commander, General Eisenhower, had made a bet that the war would be over by Christmas. And it seemed he might be right. This is John McVeigh in Paris. Those bells you can hear are the bells of Notre Dame Cathedral. And they're ringing a chime of thanksgiving that French troops have entered the city. The Western Allies had allowed a French division to enter Paris first, on the 25th of August, 1944. The French, under the leadership of General de Gaulle, were to take control of their own country as soon as they could. And the Allied soldiers who paraded in victory down the Champs-Élysées were clear that they were here only as liberators. President Roosevelt was naturally enough pleased with the Allied success. He wanted American forces to beat the Germans and then get out of Europe as quickly as possible. <sighs> ah. Eggs and the bugle. He'd already said that American troops shouldn't stay in Europe for much more than a year after the war ended. On the Eastern Front, the Red Army was also making good progress against the Nazis, moving into Poland. But were these troops liberators or conquerors? It was a question that urgently needed to be resolved. Because by the autumn of 1944, Soviet forces were advancing not only into Poland, but into Hungary and Romania as well. So what was going to happen to these countries once the Soviets had occupied them? Churchill went to Moscow in October 1944 to discuss all this with Stalin. <clears throat> it is important that you and I understand each other. Knowing that the Americans planned to leave Europe soon after the war's end, 
Churchill thought it was now down to him to try to salvage something from the Red Army's rush into Eastern Europe. This um, is rather a naughty document. The uh, Americans would be shocked if they saw how crudely I have put this. Churchill wanted to do a secret deal. Uh, I have not consulted my cabinet or parliament about this. Churchill had handed over to Stalin this document, which outlined the percentage of influence that Russia and Britain should exercise over key eastern countries like Romania and Greece. Stalin made only one change to the document. He crossed out the percentages for Bulgaria and changed them to Russia 90%, and the others, 10%. You, might this not be thought rather cynical if it seemed we had disposed of these issues so fateful to millions of people in such an offhand manner? Let us burn the paper. Our stuff is a listener. <laughs> Churchill didn't formally agree this division with Stalin. But what seems clear is that, from Churchill's point of view, this was a genuine but crude first attempt to deal with the Soviet advance into Eastern Europe. But one country was so important that it was left off Churchill's list. Poland. The very country whose independence Britain had gone to war to protect. And the problem here was an especially pressing one. But as each day passed, the soldiers of the Red Army were occupying more Polish territory. Stalin wanted to con the Poles into believing that this occupation was not what it seemed. So he made the decision to transform some of the Red Army into another army altogether. As a result, the whole of the Soviet 6th Air Force Army received surprising news in a direct order from Stalin. In October 1944, our Air Force Army was told that from the next day, we will be called the Air Force of the Polish Army. It wasn't only me, it was a lot of other people too. Soviet people, who had overnight become Polish. Our planes were Polish, the stamps on our documents were Polish, and the documents themselves were in Polish. Stalin was creating new Poles in an extension of a deception policy he'd begun a year before. A number of Soviet officers in both the Air Force and the Army had to learn to speak and write Polish and develop cover stories about which part of Poland they were to pretend to have come from. One of the Russian officers ordered to pass himself off as a Pole was Nikolai Brandt. The story was that I came from the town of Zhezhov. I said, how can I be from Zhezhov if I've never been in that town? At least I should go and have a look at it. And they said, don't worry, it doesn't exist anymore. It was completely destroyed by the Germans. I felt deep satisfaction when the Poles themselves took me for a real Pole. These officers cast aside their Red Army uniforms and were kitted out in the dress of Polish officers. 
genuine Poles were outraged. It was a terrible sight. They were unruly, they weren't elegant. They had no discipline, they looked more like riffraff. That's the way it was. And he used to pretend he's a captain, a major, or a colonel. And they would address themselves as comrades. Just imagine someone in the British Army in a British uniform who turns out to be a staunch enemy of the British. Just imagine such a person. Stalin had ordered this deception because he wanted to create Polish armed forces totally loyal to the Soviet Union. He'd always been suspicious of real Polish officers. So suspicious that four years before, Stalin had signed a secret document which had led to the mass murder of thousands of Polish officers. Many Poles suspected the Soviets of committing the crime, something which added to the strained atmosphere between the two countries. Stalin had even broken off relations with the Polish government in exile. In spite of this, Churchill managed to get Stalin to meet with them in Moscow. What guarantee will there be that there will be an independent Poland? Amid this atmosphere of mutual distrust, Churchill tried to put pressure on the Poles to make a deal. In the course of this war, we have been a hair's breadth from defeat. A sword hung over our heads. Therefore, we have the right to ask the Poles for a, a great gesture in the interest of European peace. The great gesture Churchill had in mind was the sacrifice of this land in eastern Poland. Territory which included the major cultural centre of Lvov. It was an area Stalin already knew well. Because in 1939, before the Germans had invaded the Soviet Union, the Soviets had carved up Poland with the Nazis. And eastern Poland had been taken by the Soviet Union. Now Stalin wanted the Western Allies to let the Soviets keep this land. Churchill agreed that Stalin could have eastern Poland, but he wanted to compensate the Poles with German territory to make up for their loss. This massive shift in Poland's borders would radically change the lives of many millions of people. Among the worst affected, were thousands of Poles who were fighting in the British forces. Many had already sacrificed their lives, notably here at the site of their most famous battle, Monte Cassino in Italy. The Polish government in exile knew that many of these Poles came from the very part of Poland Churchill now wanted them to give up to Stalin. Stalin was playing the tune and the rest were dancing to that tune. We lost forever a piece of Poland that was occupied and annexed by Stalin. And the majority of the soldiers were from those lands, so it was a parody. They had no homeland to go back to.
In Moscow, Churchill waited to hear the decision of the Polish government in exile. Would they agree to make what he'd called a great gesture and give up eastern Poland in exchange for a promise of land in the west? The Polish government cannot agree to the loss of nearly half of the Polish territory in the east without hearing the opinion of the Polish people. It is decisive for the government. You are no government if you are incapable of taking any decision. You are callous people who want to wreck Europe. I shall leave you to your own troubles. Churchill was exasperated, partly because he thought that Stalin would never cooperate with these Poles if they didn't give him Eastern Poland. If you want to conquer Russia, we shall leave you to do it. I feel as if I were in a lunatic asylum. I don't know whether the British government will continue to recognize you. But the Poles still refused to do what Churchill wanted, leading to this last outburst. In this war, what is your contribution to the Allied effort? What did you throw into the common pool? You may withdraw your divisions if you like. You are absolutely incapable of facing facts. Never in my life have I seen such people. The Polish issue remained unresolved. The war wasn't going well for the Western Allies on the battlefield either. In the autumn of 1944, American, British and other Allied soldiers had not managed to advance as quickly as planned. Then in December 1944, the Germans counterattacked. In the forest of the Ardennes in Belgium. During this Battle of the Bulge, the Americans lost 80,000 killed or wounded. It was clear that this war would not be over by Christmas. Western allies were not going to penetrate as far into Europe as they had hoped. While the Western allies were held up in the Ardennes fighting the Battle of the Bulge, on the Eastern Front, the Red Army was making good progress. They entered Warsaw on the 17th of January, 1945. The locals cheered as the Polish units in the Red Army passed by. They did not know that some of the officers they applauded were from the Soviet Union and were only pretending to be Poles. I went to Warsaw and I was walking on the streets there when a Polish lady ran to me. In the end she said, oh, at last, I can see a real Polish officer. How wonderful that is. We started to talk, and then I saw she looked somehow disappointed. She asked me, but why is your accent so bad? You must be from Krakow. I said, no, I come from Zhezhov. I didn't want to admit I was Russian. It would look bad. A Russian officer in the Polish army, it would look like a fake army. I felt that if I had undertaken to be a Polish commanding officer, 
let everyone continue thinking that I was Polish. Stalin hadn't just created new Polish officers. He'd created an entire new Polish government. Unlike the Polish government in exile, this group of tame Poles would do just what Stalin told them to. Stalin gave an insight into the way he liked to manage those who worked for him at a Kremlin banquet around the same time, one which was given for visiting French politicians. Ah, товарищ маршал. Хочу выпить тост в вашу честь. Он создал великолепные военно-воздушные силы. Идите сюда. Но если он будет плохо работать, плохо будет делать свое дело, мы его расстреляем. In fact, Marshal Novikov was arrested just over a year later and forced by the secret police to make a false confession. He then served more than five years in prison. Вот вы где? Это начальник тыла. Это его работа поставлять людей и продовольствие. И все для фронта. Если он будет плохо выполнять свое дело, мы его повесим. Какой у нас в стране обычай? За ваше здоровье, начальник тыл. The Red Army continued to push forward, further into Eastern Europe, capturing Budapest, the capital of Hungary, in February 1945. The Hungarians had been allies of the Nazis. Together with the Germans, they had fought fiercely against the Red Army. Now they would pay for it. Soviet forces paid a special visit to the Hungarian General Credit Bank. They opened every safe and strong box. They took away 113 million penga in cash as well as about 800 suitcases and other containers deposited by clients, and emptied 1,400 safe deposit boxes. Nearby, other Soviets took paintings and other works of art worth billions of pounds, including works by Renoir, El Greco and Goya. An estimated 99% of these artworks have never been recovered. As well as the wealth of the city, the population was also at the mercy of the Soviet occupiers. And what happened to them in the aftermath of the Soviet victory in Budapest was to become infamous. Agnes Karlik was just one of the Hungarian women who suffered at the hands of Soviet forces. Agnes had been hiding in a cellar with her family during the siege. But then evening came, early evening, and all of a sudden this rough type of soldiers entered the building. They started to pull women out with the excuse to come and help us peel potatoes. 
and my sister and myself were dragged away. And my grandmother came with us. For myself, I felt absolutely so frightened that I was just rigid from fright. So they pushed us into this tent type of arrangement and they raped us. It was, we were just young, very young, and we didn't know what they were doing because that time children were brought up differently than nowadays, not so aware. And it, it was such a, I still got nightmares about it. Though the Red Army soldiers who committed rape during the war were guilty of a crime under Soviet law, only a small minority of the perpetrators were ever charged. Soldiers gossiped about it. They said they were proud. They felt like heroes because they slept with a woman. I feel hurt because our army earned itself such a reputation. Also, I feel angry about the people that acted this way. So bad was the situation in Hungary that a group of Hungarian communists in Kurbanya sent a letter of complaint to the Soviet authorities. In January, so the report says, when the Red Army arrived, they committed a series of sexual crimes in an outbreak of savage hatred. Drunken soldiers raped mothers in front of their children and husbands. Girls as young as 12 were dragged from their fathers and mothers and raped in succession by 10 to 15 soldiers from whom many of them caught venereal diseases. A clue to what Stalin thought about the way some of the Red Army soldiers were acting can be seen from his attitude at a banquet in the winter of 1944. The Yugoslavian communist Milovan Gilas and his wife were among the guests. Gilas had previously criticized the behavior of the Red Army as they advanced into Yugoslavia. Just like the communists in Hungary, Gilas had been concerned by reports of rape and had complained to the Red Army authorities, something that was clearly on Stalin's mind on the night of the banquet. Soldati, Krasny army, Zatri Krasnych, Soldat, Красной армии, которую вынудили прокладывать путь через тысячи километров разоренной и опустошенной страны. И эта армия терпит оскорбление от Зилас. Как вы не можете понять солдата, который Прошел тысячи верст сквозь огонь, кровь и смерть. И потом, потом проводит время с женщиной или поднимает какие-то безделушки. А теперь я вынужден поцеловать вашу жену. Пусть даже будучи обвиненным насилием.
за нашу героическую Красную Армию. In February 1945, Stalin traveled here, to Yalta on the Black Sea in the south of the Soviet Union, to attend what would become the most famous meeting of the war. The discussions with Churchill and Roosevelt were to be held in the Livadia Palace, the former holiday home of the imperial family. By the time of the conference here, prospects for a swift end to the war in Europe looked good once again. Red Army soldiers were encamped fewer than 50 miles from Berlin, and the Western Allies had recovered from the German counter-attack and were just crossing into the Rhineland. But the pressures of the war had clearly taken their toll on one of the leaders of the Alliance. Churchill looked at Roosevelt um, so very solicitously, Churchill, I suppose, had no surprise, as I had and anyone else who'd seen uh, Roosevelt previously, to see this gaunt, very thin figure. His face was waxen to sort of yellow and waxen and very drawn, very thin. Uh, and a lot of the time he was sort of sitting sitting there with his mouth open, sort of staring ahead. Uh, so that was quite a shock to see him in that state. And the contrast between Roosevelt and Stalin was striking. Stalin was full of beans. He was smiling, he was genial to everybody, and, and I mean really everybody, even to junior ranks like myself. At the conference, the one question that was discussed more than any other was, predictably, the future of Poland. It was a problem made more urgent by the fact that Poland currently had two completely different governments, one in exile in London, recognized by Britain and America, and one in Warsaw, recognized by the Soviet Union. If we accept that each recognize separate governments, this will be interpreted all over the world as a sign of cleavage between the Soviet government on the one hand and the USA and British governments on the other. We согласны с тем, что польское правительство должно быть избрано демократическим путем. День выборов не далек, но до той поры нам придется иметь дело с временным правительством. How long before elections could be held? Сколько времени осталось до того, как можно будет проводить выборы? Примерно через месяц, если только не случится крутого перелома событий на фронте и немцы нас не разобьют. Думаю, этого не будет. It looked as if Stalin would cooperate with the West. And at Yalta, much was finally settled between the Allies. The future boundaries of the new Poland were agreed, and as a result, those of the new, smaller Germany. The Allies also decided on the formation of the United Nations after the war. The newsreel coverage was decidedly optimistic. This meeting crystallizes the Allied resolve that Germany shall be beaten unconditionally and that lasting peace shall prevail throughout the world. The optimism didn't last long. Here in Poland on the 28th of March 1945, just a few weeks after signing the Yalta Agreement, the Soviets showed how sincere they really were about Polish political independence.
16 leading independent political and military figures in Poland arrived for what they had been told was to be a lunch with senior Soviet officials. We will meet them to be able to win. It is not far away, from 9 km from here. It is more comfortable than here, in this primitive situation. We will meet you on a lunch, not far away, 9 km from here. But they weren't just going on a short journey. And they weren't just going for lunch. In fact, they were all transported over 700 miles to here, the Lubyanka prison in Moscow. The Polish leaders had made a big mistake. They trusted the Soviet authorities. Each of them was imprisoned and interrogated. And then they waited to see the final fate Stalin had in store for them. Churchill was outraged by Stalin's actions in Poland after Yalta, writing to Roosevelt on the 13th of March, 1945, that Poland has lost her frontier. Is she now to lose her freedom? Roosevelt was more relaxed about the whole dispute with Stalin. Just before Yalta, he'd even remarked that apart from matters concerning Germany, he wanted to stay out of disputes in Europe as far as possible. He wrote to Churchill in early April that, I would minimize the general Soviet problem as much as possible because these problems in one form or another seem to arise every day and most of them straighten out. Roosevelt was still keen to get on with Stalin, partly because the Soviet leader had offered to help with what was happening here, in the Far East, in the war against Japan. Americans made up the bulk of the Allied forces who were engaged in the Pacific in what was known as island hopping, the struggle to wrest each island from the Japanese. It was a brutal and bloody war. Just eight days after the Yalta Agreement, the Americans had launched one of their fiercest assaults here, on the island of Iwo Jima, 750 miles south of Tokyo. Just after nine o'clock in the morning on the 19th of February, 1945, the first wave of US Marines landed on the island. The battle for this piece of volcanic rock less than eight miles square would be horrific for both sides. Of the 21,000 Japanese defenders, 20,000 would die in the struggle. The total American casualties on Iwo Jima, including wounded, were over 25,000, more than the Allies suffered on D-Day. So Roosevelt was intensely grateful that Stalin had promised the Soviet Union would help the Western Allies and enter the war against Japan once Germany was defeated. The wreckage along the beach was only a small part of the cost of 26 days of fighting. What happened on Iwo Jima was a stark reminder of the determination of the Japanese to resist at all costs. We were taxiing in to Iwo Jima, and the runways had just been built. I passed right by a graveyard. Indescribable number of crosses, uh, of, of uh, hit markers. Uh, I couldn't look any longer. I somehow I became traumatized with the effect of what price had been paid for that island, and the reason they took it was so I could have a runway. I, I couldn't describe to you how I was uh, affected by that. And when I came to realize that they were just kids like myself, 
that wouldn't wouldn't be going home. Sorry. I um I just couldn't make it anymore. It it just took something out of me that I didn't know was there. I thought I was pretty tough. I wasn't tough. It seemed as if the war in the Pacific had many months, if not years, to go before Allied victory. But over 5,000 miles away, the war in Europe was about to reach a conclusion. In Moscow, Stalin ordered two of his best military commanders, Marshal Zhukov and Marshal Konyev, to attend a meeting at the Kremlin on the 2nd of April, 1945. They would now plan the assault on Berlin. Stalin was in a hurry. Stalin had hit on a novel idea to speed the capture of Berlin, a race between these two marshals. Товарищ Сталин, войска Первого Украинского фронта будут своевременно перегруппированы и готовы атаковать Берлин. Товарищ Сталин, войска Первого Белорусского фронта к указанному вами сроку будут готовы наступать на Берлин. Хорошо. Кто первый из вас ворвется, тот пусть и берет Берлин. Soldiers of Zhukov's 1st Belarusian Front crossed the Oder River and prepared to launch a massive attack on the Zelo Heights in front of Berlin, the last major defensive position before the capital. But while Stalin's idea of the race between the two marshals may have increased the speed of the assault, it also increased the chance of Red Army soldiers dying from friendly fire. Sapirnik. They were rivals. There was rivalry between the two fronts. It was such a big chaos, and in that chaos, it's very easy to kill someone else. Despite the confusion, Stalin's plan worked. Within a few days, the Red Army was fighting in the center of Berlin and was shelling Hitler's subterranean refuge, the Führerbunker. But that spring, here in a remote part of Georgia in the United States, the leadership of the Alliance was also about to change. President Roosevelt's illness had grown still more serious, and he had traveled to Warm Springs, his traditional health retreat. On the 12th of April, as he posed for a portrait in this room, he suffered a cerebral hemorrhage and died. Franklin Roosevelt, who had been president of America for 12 years, did not live to see victory over the Nazis. Just over two weeks later, on the 30th of April, Adolf Hitler took his own life, and shortly afterwards, Germany surrendered. For four years, the Red Army had borne the brunt of the German aggression. In helping to defeat the Nazis, the Soviets had liberated camps like Auschwitz, which revealed the true horror of Hitler's regime. The human cost for the Red Army in this war had been immense, 11 million military dead. But now the war in Europe was finally over. Many thoughts were passing through my mind in those happy minutes. 
the difficult battle for Moscow where our soldiers had been fighting to the death while not letting the enemy enter our capital, Stalingrad in its ruins, thousands of destroyed towns and villages, millions and millions of victims of the Soviet nation that survived and won. So here it was, the final destruction of fascist Germany, the goal for which we had sacrificed ourselves for the last four years. But in Berlin and the rest of Germany, there were some Soviet soldiers who now celebrated victory just as they had in Budapest. Suddenly, my sister-in-law came round. She'd been raped several times that night. Parents had told her that life is over. Who knows where your husband is or whether he's even coming back. So they all went up to the attic to hang themselves. Both the parents died immediately. But my sister-in-law was saved by neighbours, and since they knew where we lived, they brought her to us. She was completely worn out. You could even still see the rope marks on her neck. Those horror stories didn't fit the propaganda picture of the time which was one of optimism and joy. In April, the Western Allies had finally joined up with the Red Army. In scenes acted out for the newsreel, the soldiers from the different systems of government appeared to have much in common. But behind the scenes, it was another story. Churchill was so concerned about Stalin's behaviour after Yalta that he'd asked his military planners to consider a possible worst-case scenario, a British military attack on the Soviet Union. Called, aptly enough, Operation Unthinkable and headed Russia Threat to Western Civilization, the final report was completed on the 22nd of May, 1945. The conclusion of the report was that the result of a total war with Russia is not possible to forecast, but the one thing certain is that to win it would take us a very long time. The chief of the Imperial General Staff, Sir Alan Brooke, wrote in his diary, The idea is, of course, fantastic, and the chances of success quite impossible. <laughs> The atmosphere was so strained between the Western Allies and the Soviet leadership here in Moscow that the new president, Harry Truman, turned to one of Roosevelt's most trusted former aides to help sort it out, Harry Hopkins. Marshal Stalin. He met Stalin in the Kremlin on the 27th of May, 1945, fewer than three weeks after the war in Europe had ended. There were major problems. Stalin still hadn't held the promised free elections in Poland, and the British and Americans wouldn't recognize his tame Polish government. But Stalin denied he was doing anything wrong, and instead went on the attack. Hopkins did his best to respond reasonably to Stalin's insult. Marshal Stalin, the question of Poland per se is not as important as the fact that it has become a symbol for how we work out, solve problems that arise with the Soviet Union. We have no special interest in Poland and no special desire to see any particular form of government. Of course, we'll accept any government that the Polish people choose, one that is friendly to the Soviet Union. And it is the desire of the United States government that the Polish should be friendly to the Soviet Union. 
Hopkins did manage to reach a compromise with Stalin. Until any elections took place, Poland would be ruled by a government that now included a few of the Poles favoured by the West. But it was Stalin who had really won this long fight, since his own tame politicians remained in a majority and the promised free elections in Poland never took place. Those of us who worked and lived in Moscow knew that there was not a chance in hell that Stalin would allow free elections in those countries when he didn't allow them in the Soviet Union. As for the 16 independent Poles tricked into meeting the Soviet authorities by an offer of lunch, they were all put on trial. Of the 16, 13 were sentenced to various terms in Soviet prisons. In Moscow, Stalin was about to turn on some of those who had helped him win the war. Preparations were made for a massive victory parade and Stalin had asked Marshal Zhukov to prepare to take a mounted salute. But when Zhukov met Stalin's son, Vasily, at stables outside Moscow, he discovered that he hadn't exactly been first choice for the task. The victory parade was held in Moscow on the 24th of June, 1945. This celebration didn't just represent the final Soviet success against the Nazi invaders. It symbolized the triumph of the Red Army across Eastern Europe. And this mighty army, once in place, was going to prove almost impossible to dislodge. The victory parade was a brilliant event in the life of the Soviet Union. I can still see it in my mind's eye. It was a summer's day. It was raining, but the red square was decorated with red banners. People were wearing medals and orders, and they were shining so much that the light reflected on the whole of Red Square. As the hands of the clock moved close to ten, everyone stood to attention. There were the Kremlin chimes, and at that moment, Georgi Zhukov, three times hero of the Soviet Union, rode into the square on a white horse. He sat on the horse so elegantly, as if he were a junior lieutenant. I think that when Stalin himself saw those two army commanders and their horses, he felt jealous. Because, of course, he should have inspected the parade, or commanded the parade. 
but he couldn't do it. I think that's how the jealousy of Zhukov started. The war in Europe was over, but as far as Stalin was concerned, there was still unfinished business. Проблема Жукова в том, что он неблагодарный, а должен был бы быть благодарен товарищу Сталину. Жуков experiences firsthand the consequences of Stalin's jealousy. Его надо поставить на место. Conflict grows in the wake of the Nazis' defeat, as the Western Allies still try to ensure the independence of the countries occupied by the Soviet Union. With regards to Romania and in particular... And Churchill fears the division of Europe. An iron fence has come down around them. Сказки все это, бабушки. Сказки бабушки Арине. Entering Germany, East Easy Company are face to face with the real horrors of war. Band of Brothers continues tonight at 11.20. Next on BBC Two, it's Hislop, Merton and David Mitchell. And have they got news for you?